Treating your need for healthcare news, we are NHG. News, views and insider truths from the heart of the healthcare sector. We are the NHG team. I'm Emily. I'm Matt. I'm Ilsa. And each episode, we will connect you to the people behind the UK health sector, sharing insights and innovation. This podcast is brought to you by Evo North, uniting leaders from the public and private sector to collaborate, share exciting innovations and build a stronger northern powerhouse together. So hello and welcome to the NHE podcast. It's a special one today. We're doing an on-the-go podcast. I'm here with Matt and you've got myself, Emily. We're here with Victor Adebowale, who is currently the chief executive of Turning Point. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yes. Um, so, Victor, we um, obviously we've heard your chief executive at uh, Turning Point. You've recently actually announced you're stepping down from that yeah, role yeah, after almost yeah, 20 years yeah, at the yeah. end of March. Yeah. It's an incredible sort of um, time you spent there. It's incredible well, work you've done with it. What sort of led to that decision? It's quite a significant change there. Well, it is, but, um, you know, sometimes in life you've got to take a look around and decide, um, you know, staying in one place um, because you love it and because it's um, comfortable in a sense, not, not it's hard work, yeah. but isn't good enough for a reason, if you see what I mean? I if you're the leader, you have to look around and say, you know, what is my job now? And mm. Sometimes your job is to hand on to the next next yeah. person Definitely. Uh, and, and, and to say well have I done enough because you can never do everything but have I done enough is the place have I, have I made a difference is the place better than when I found it yeah have you left and it I, better yeah basically and the conclusion yeah. I came to although some might disagree but I think the evidence is that uh, I found I've left it you know better when I found it and um, I got a great team of colleagues um, in le- leading yeah the business and I thought you know what what else is out there which is a bit scary mm-hmm. yeah. but again being scared isn't another reason to stay you know yeah. <laughs> that's kind of placing my anxieties on the on the business instead of so I thought you know what I want to I want to see what else they say don't they that what good things about. happen at the end of your comfort zone there we go well, I'm certainly yeah. at the end of that comfort zone <laughs> that's for sure yeah. uh, I thought well I want to see what happens yeah because you know, so, you stay and don't want to be carried out in a pine box or do I want to try something else and, and I, I just yeah. think let's try something let's learn some new things I think. definitely I don't think there's yeah. ever a bad time to learn new skills pass the no, boat on over no. and turning points futures you know the, the, the best time the people say never a good time to leave there is the best time to leave is when you think the future of the business is yeah. going, going up, up. Going yeah. up. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you're not jumping from a sinking ship no, you're yeah, leaving it as not, it, is. No, it continues no, I've got, there's a great leadership team there we're doing some amazing things yeah so can you tell us a little bit about the work at Turning Point well I mean we, are, we, we provide um, health and social care services to 100,000 people um, in uh, just over 300 locations in England um, we employ 4,000 staff and 98% of our services that are registered with the CQC are either good or outstanding wow. our turnover will be 130 odd million this year um, we've grown from an organisation when I started in um, just 2001 uh, from an organisation I think it was about 19 million something like that 20 million to 130 million in that time I think we're on the map as a, as a health and social care business uh, focused on reversing the inverse care law i.e. that's more the space that those in need of health and social care the most tend to get it the least mm-hmm. uh, we've done some groundbreaking work in substance misuse mental health learning disabilities our current platform um, is 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 as much about incorporating the digital world and actually um, uh, 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 creating new services that, that uh, people can access through a computer or on a phone, um, uh, machine learning, stuff that enables you to interact with a machine when you want, uh, but also choose to talk to a human being. And we find that people are actually choosing to work with the, uh, the app work with, uh, and you know when they, when they need to talk to a human, we're using that sort of digital, uh, those digital platforms, not only to provide services, but to really, really help us look at how we use the most precious resource that we've got which is time mm. uh, how do we allocate uh, uh, caseloads how do we work with um, individuals how do we store how do we uh, look at data information all that's very new and I mean, we're doing some groundbreaking stuff um, uh, call handling all that sort of stuff um, and it's really exciting 
um, but we're also doing some really good work around public health, so integration of substance misuse services with mental health, so that people have one stop shop. My view, my view of any service really, but certainly a turning point is that our job is to reduce what I call negative value transfer, which means you should get as much as possible in one one visit mm -hmm. basically yeah. bang for your buck yeah you shouldn't have to be moved on from place to place to place to place mm -hmm. uh, because that costs you time and the system uh, money public purse money so we've tried to create services that are single uh, one stop shop um, that deal as much as possible now we're challenged by the way services are commissioned in this country um, in health and social care they're often commissioned in silos yeah you know, which yeah. doesn't help because people we, we know that people tend not to have their challenges in silos. <laughs> yeah, no, so, nobody fits a nice little uh, tick box exactly. these people days. Don't, people, that's not how people work. So we've been looking and working on new models of service delivery, um, things that we do, say, in Luton, which is where we deliver a, a wellbeing service, which is incorporating mental health, physical health, um, uh, wellbeing, substance misuse, um, helping to keep people out of hospital, so people have been in hospital uh, that need rehabilitation, maintaining a healthy lifestyle. We do that at scale for Luton. We're working with the primary care system in Luton, we're man helping that system manage demand. And I think that's repeatable in many of our health systems. So we're contributing to uh, managing population health. So I think that's a growth area for Turning Point um, because as an organisation, we need to be, uh, my colleagues, hopefully when I, when I, when I leave, will continue uh, to ensure that what we can show is our contribution to any health system mm. is that we manage demand and we particularly manage demand for those people at the sharp end of the inverse care law. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I suppose sort of managing that health and that well-being, especially away from the traditional health um, organisations, a lot of the groups and the companies and that, that have stepped up, like uh, Turning Point, are social enterprise organisations. They, they fill these yeah. voids. Um, we heard recently at Social Enterprise Awards from the uh, Mayor Andy Burnham from here in yes. Greater Manchester yeah. that uh, this region could very well become the social enterprise capital of the uh, the UK. Um, sort of your thoughts on that um, well I'm the chair of Social Enterprise UK so I was very pleased yeah. to see um, I was very pleased to see Andy um, at our, our awards ceremony um, and he made this statement he wants yeah. he wants Manchester to be the social enterprise capital of the UK and, he, and it's, he, he means it you know we, he's keen to see uh, more social enterprises I'm sitting in the on the ninth we're on the ninth floor of the co-op um, yeah. uh, the co-op group's headquarters on Angel Square in Manchester um, the co-op group is a member of Social Enterprise UK Okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and met with, uh, I know that our chief exec met with um, Andy Burnham recently. Um, I'll be speaking at a conference on the new economy in Oldham, um, which is part of the Greater Manchester. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, he's putting, he's putting his money where his mouth is, and putting his, yeah. his time yeah. where his mouth is. I think we have to help him deliver on that promise. Um, social enterprises have got well-researched benefits for the local economies. They tend to uh, increase people's income, where they operate in, in places where there's poverty. They tend to employ more women, more BME people. They're the fastest growing form of um, uh, business structure in the country. They're employing more young people. So it's a no-brainer if you're yeah. the mayor of Greater Manchester. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, you, you, why wouldn't you want it to be the capital? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's, it's, win -win. It's, it's sort of one of them that it's probably for to hear quite often but Andy is actually putting sort of is backing what he's saying he, he it's by his words he is, he is and I think well, well like all politicians uh, we need to help keep him to his word yeah it's, it's, it's not that we don't believe him it's that uh, it's that maintaining uh, that. It's, uh, yes yes and I think every citizen in a democracy has a duty to be sceptical which doesn't mean cynical so that means we have to help him deliver definitely so come April then you're going to be the new chair of the NHS Confederation I am yeah. it's a very exciting role it's a mm. role with a lot of responsibility and a lot of um, a lot of things to be working on. What yeah. kind of things yeah. do you hope to come from that role? 
Well, I mean, I don't know. You know <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not one of these people who've got the sort of hundred day plan. I think, um, I think what I want to do first of all is, is understand. Um, you know, the NHS Confed is it represents hospital trusts, yeah. uh, primary care networks, um, uh, the whole panoply uh, STPs, integrated care systems. There's a whole, you know, ecology. The, yeah. of, the, the, the many acronyms. The many, many acronyms. <laughs> yeah, and I think what we need to do, what I need to do, is understand the needs of the members. Like, what is going on? You know, what are, what is at the top of their wish lists in 2020? 20, how can we add value um, to the lives? I'm very much focused on the end user. So ultimately, the the NHS Confed. Yes, it's about our members, but ultimately, it's about patients. It's about citizens and you know the NHS provides a service to a million people a day the, the NHS Confect needs to know how it's contributing to making their lives better through its services to members so I'm interested in that yeah. And, and, yeah. and so I'm interested in how members see themselves in that role and how the NHS Confect can add value um, to them on the one hand on the other hand there's a story we have to tell to government and to NHS England and NHSI about how their leadership and how their resource and how their permission for resource is being used and what do we need to improve things and how do we work better together so you know, on the one hand there's a, there's a kind of representation piece on the other hand there's a kind of service to the user piece and I'm, I'm just interested in how that's gonna how that's gonna play out and, and my first thing to do is learn as much as possible definitely certainly and I suppose as that sort of learning process and with your experience at turning point you've got quite a, a repertoire of adding benefit into these sort of well, things I mean, these. <laughs> I'm, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping that uh, I've got some transferable skills I'm, and hopefully I'm going to yeah. have to learn some new ones. I mean, I have got, uh, I am working, I set up an organisation called Collaborate a while ago and it's just published a, a view, a vision, I suppose, a manifesto about the future of public services. And, I, and I'm interested in, in that because, you know, I think we're in a position where if we keep doing the same things, getting what we've always got is pretty much unacceptable. You know, yeah. this is, we're in the North. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just had an election which was very much about the North um, and I think we, we, the core really is for us to do things differently and do things in a way that people feel there's a difference in the service they get rather than the talk that they receive or the yeah. Yeah. rhetoric and that's going to involve a different way of, of looking at things it's going to involve taking people's needs seriously from the ground up and changing the way we lead and not just pushing things down and you know expecting people to accept it without without yeah. you know question that's, I think those days are over definitely and that sort of spins into I suppose the, the next question I have if we have say there is a lot of this need to for action not just rhetoric is there any particular areas going into this NHS confederal that you already know or perhaps you expect that you'll hear from members um in the healthcare service that maybe are missing or lacking these support. I don't know I mean I hear different things already about you know people um, uh, different aspects of people's experience of, of providing services and commissioning services I guess there's questions about um, population health um, how do we how do we really bring things together so that the um, patient citizen as I call them um, actually experiences the one stop shop the yeah. single point of contact the positive value transfer as opposed to the negative value transfer um, how do we change an NHS from a system which somebody asked me the other day you know how do we know the NHS is working and I, I'm my view is we know it's you know it's working when a person in pain goes to their GP and is seen because they're in pain yeah. as yeah. opposed to an NHS which is passing its services and saying well you might be in pain but if it's not life threatening you're yeah. on the list yeah <laughs> yeah you know? <laughs> and and it was the public accepting that as normative. Well, you know, the NHS is under pressure. I mean, yeah. agony. When yeah. I'm dying, I'll get I'll get a hospital <laughs> appointment. Or you get an elective care appointment, then it's cancelled. And mm. you know, these are all questions of organisation, of resource, of leadership. Um, I hear that a lot from from um, from the public, actually, apart from anything else. Um, and those are things that any change that we make to the NHS and the way it operates, and we have to make change. I think I think the the money that the government has allocated to us and is coming down the road in this bill, I don't think it's good enough to just say, well, it's not enough. Mm. I yeah. think what we have to say is, what can we do with this money to transform the NHS so that it meets the needs of the population? 
and we have to be honest with the public about what that means. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, and where and, and with the public say to the government, this is what you get for that money. This is the value that we can add. Absolutely. I don't think it's a case of um, um, uh, just asking for more without showing how we're going to use what we've got. Definitely. We hear a lot as well, don't we, about moving towards a more joined up care and health and yeah. care um, well, system. Key. That's key. And, and I think you know that is key. We, we've been talking about integration for a long time now between health and social care um, there is a challenge which is we need more money in the social care system mm. we, we absolutely do and um, but I think there's also what can we do with what we've got mm-hmm. uh, how can we bring the services together or you know we're in Manchester where there, there, there seems to be um, uh, evidence that you can integrate services at least at the, the, at the leadership you, you can do that you can um, uh, commission services Services that are integrated for people, uh, as long as you understand the people, you yeah. have to start yeah. with the people. You have to co-design. You have to engage populations in the design of those services. Mm. Um, otherwise, it, it, you tend you tend to repeat the same mistakes. A big thing at the moment, as well, is digital innovation in healthcare. Yeah. yeah. Well. How big do you think that role should be? Well, I think digital innovation. I mean, I declare an interest. I had set up a business well, some years ago now called Visionable, which provides uh, a visual platform for health and social care and we did that because um, we f- we knew we had many cases including one personal to me of people who had complex cancers say um, requiring multidisciplinary teams and the difficulty of getting people to look at single data when they're in one of them different places, different places. Yeah. so our technology does that mm-hmm. um, and you know my view is that technology is absolutely essential to the future of the NHS in fact I would say there are only three challenges Challenges for the NHS, in fact, for most healthcare systems in the West, and that is equity, which isn't the same as equality. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Equity is about the woman in Barkin and Dagen who has an active life expectancy of 53, <laughs> yeah. as opposed to the woman in Richmond who has an active life expectancy of 70, yeah. right? Getting them a service that meets her needs. Um, Access, which is about, you know, it's about workforce, it's about commissioning and how we're commissioning and whether commissioning is appropriate in terms of designing services, um, uh, service design, or that's access and technology in that order. Now, if technology doesn't meet the first two, why are we doing it? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it, those are the three challenges that pretty much, and technology plays a critical role, but it has to it has to be in service of the first two. It can't just be pursuing its own ends because mm-hmm. people, you know, because there's a moral profit to be made. There is a, I've got no problem with people making money yeah. in yeah. the service of the first two things. Definitely. So, you know, Visionable is attempting to um, increase access and equity by providing a platform that enables you in your house to see your doctor yeah. without having to travel with your. In fact, we've got a case study of a woman with four kids who you normally yeah. has to trek to the clinic with her kids as a single parent who can look down the. That look on a TV screen or a computer and have that that um, consultation um, without having to do that. Yeah. But that has implications for the way we structure things like tariffs and rewards and all that sort of yeah. stuff. But it's got to come. It's got to come. And we have to get the basics right. So, you know, I watched um, the speech by um, the last um, president of the RCGP when she said, well, it takes me 17 minutes to turn my computer on. <laughs> Don't talk to me about AI and machine yeah. learning. Can, can yeah. we just fix? <laughs> yeah, start the button. <laughs> yeah. Can we just sort this, this stuff out first? Yeah. You know? um, so unless 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 the technology solves the access and equity issue, I, I'm not particularly impressed. Yeah, I mean it, it's a conversation we've had from guests we've had on in the past as well that there's no point innovating for innovating sake. It's no. got to have this need, this benefit yeah. to it. Like you say, you can have the greatest AI technology in the world, but as uh, you, you were mentioning, there's no point doing that in a trust where the yeah. The computer yeah. system can't handle it. I agree, and I think what we have to do is we have to do what we can do now, rather than dream about the future. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think what what can we do now is more important. We, we have a shortfall of we have hundred thousand vacancies in the NHS. Yeah. That's a challenge, not just because we've got the vacancies, but because how do we use the um, the resource that we've got now? to the best of their ability. So we've got specialist stroke specialists, for instance, 
how do we make sure that we're using them to the max? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're not working them today. Yeah. I mean, using them to the max. I mean, so yeah. I'm not sitting on twiddling their thumbs or waiting for the next bit. But actually, we're using yeah. technology to connect them with patients, with hospitals. That's what technology is. That's an access point and an equity point. Yeah. That's how technology should there's, be. There's no point having, as you say, a say, stroke surgeon up in the northwest, no patients, and suddenly there's a demand down in the, the yeah, southeast makes when no we sense. can connect. It makes no sense, which is actually one of the things that Visionable does. We run yeah. this East of England stroke network. Yeah. So it, it's, it, yeah. anyway, it's not an advert for Visionable East. <laughs> but, but I'm saying technology works. Yeah. And yeah. Livy is another organisation which is doing interesting things, you know, actually um, not removing people from the NHS, but making it easier for, for, them, for them to see their doctor using the technology. There's some, some wonderful technology which uh, doctors are using now, which is a bleep, um, but it gives them information. So, yeah. that, you know, that, that, that stuff is being rolled out and it will and it is making a difference. Um, there's a, a wonderful IO tech, the technology which allows beer analysis using a, uh, using a mobile phone. You know, there's, there's these things. They are happening. They are happening, yeah. but they have to happen everywhere. Mm-hmm. What you can't have are, are holes where, you know, you get excellent service in Barnsley, but in Wakefield, oh, sorry, we don't use that because we can't yeah. be bothered or we, oh, we can't function it. Yeah, there was a question yeah. about spread, yeah, uh, particularly in things like primary care. You know, how do we get a spread of innovation so that everybody gets the best, not some people and others going, well, you know, you can't have it here. You know. Super. Um, and sort of to build on that a bit there, um, I'm guessing that very much is the message then to these companies that are involved in this sort of techno innovation that actually meet this equity, meet this access mm. and keep pushing it there. Mm. And we will be uh, set to, you will get involved in the NHS this way. Well, I mean, the two things aren't, you know, I mean, uh, the, the, I mean Vision is already involved in it. It's been involved in the NHS for 10 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, probably, long, uh, probably longer. Um, it's got nothing to do with my roles in any, anywhere else. You asked me a question about technology. I have some experience yeah. in that. Um, I think it, there's, there's a, there are implications for technology in the way the NHS is designed. I mean, my view is technology has to meet the equity and access issue um, at scale. Yeah. It has to be at scale, otherwise it doesn't, it doesn't work. And I think the NHS has to be in charge in a sense. He has to he has to be able to say we need technology to do this mm-hmm. because otherwise everybody's diving in. <laughs> it just becomes yeah. very difficult to kind of manage. So what's the process then if a company wanted to get in front of the NHS and, and tell them that we have this product and we think it could work? <laughs> you know, a number of people ask me that question. I mean the process, I'm not sure there is a clear process, to be honest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think um, what I would say is that um, patience is required. Yeah. Um, and I think that's good in a way because um, these things should be tested. They should be designed with, not for. Yeah. They should be understood. The benefits should be understood. And when they meet the equity and access test, should also be tested. That takes time. Um, I know that that's. Um, uh, often, you know, it takes too long, you know, why can't we just buy it? Well, why should they? Yeah. <laughs> when you yeah. walk into a shop to buy something, you don't just take what the shopkeeper offers, you have yeah. a look around what and make sure that it's going to fit, does it, does it, does it meet yeah. your needs, right? Yeah. So I'm afraid the onus is on the purveyor of that, of that service to be patient, to understand the needs of the client and to work with the client to make the change necessary to, to move the needle, right? So my, my first advice I guess is to be patient. It takes time. It should take time. You're dealing with our most precious public service jewel, yes. you know, yeah. and it's a partnership. And you know, there are these key tests. I guess um, uh, there are lots of you know NHS Digital, NHS um, X, um, NHS England, NHS I, um, uh, uh, academic health science networks. Um, digital hubs there's lots of things out there that are all trying to understand yeah. and I'm sure all of them are inundated with the, with the next new thing absolutely uh, and in a way that's a good thing uh, providing there's a filter that says well actually these things we need these things yeah. we want these things will make a difference these things are scalable and I'm afraid these things are lovely mm. but they're not, not gonna, for us. they're not going to deliver the, the equity access point they're not you know they don't work or they don't work as well they're not scalable Thanks. 
<laughs> yeah. and everyone needs to be on the same page as well. Really, I think so. Me? I think so. I think like a lot of digital change, it's not about the digital, it's about the human. Mm. It's about the culture, it's about the transformation. And that's what takes time. You know, that's what takes um, time. You have to work with people, you know, the best, well, most, the best um, services and devices are co-produced with the customer you know, and if, so if you want to get maximum spread co-produced with the customer yeah i mean as, as you say there you, you walk into a store the only thing you're going to pick up and buy straight away is something you know that's not going to last you very long basically, but that's the last yeah. thing we want in the healthcare basically, service yeah basically yes i think there's no saying there in silicon valley you know yeah. fast and break things and yeah <laughs> and, and i just kind of think well yeah okay that's that might work but uh we, we have a limited resource. I'm not sure breaking things is what... No, we don't need that. No, <laughs> I'm it, it, not convinced that that's entirely suitable for the it's NHS. It's certainly not the tagline we want with the, uh, the NHS. And no. I'm sure it's sort of a, a, a point that you, you've you talked about at, depth, at length there as somebody that's experienced this whole side, having that patience, having that access. I think, so. I think it's about patience. I think I'd say it's about patience. It is, it is about learning, as you, it's about learning, thinking long and learning short, yeah. you know, and build and, and collaboration, you know, that's, yeah. the way, that's the way it should be done, that's the way we've done it at Vision Ball, that's where we did it at Turning Point, you know, yeah. it's, I'm afraid it's not a quick fix. No. Well, we are super excited for you, for your new your new role, and we want to wish you the best. Well, thank you we, We're sure that well, you're going to make a, just as good impact on NHS Confed that you have done on Turning Point. Oh, no pressure there. I know. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I'll do my best. Hopefully, I'm going to need, if, you're, if anybody's listening to this, I'm going to need all the help I can get. We support you. <laughs> we, we look forward to, uh, to covering all of the success that will no doubt happen in the future. Yeah. But sure. it's, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the time. We know you're a very, very busy man, as everyone's heard. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Lovely. Right. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by Evo North, uniting leaders from the public and private sector to collaborate, share exciting innovations and build a stronger northern powerhouse together. Join the chat on social media using the hashtag WeAreNHE or send us an email via the link on our website. If you enjoyed today's podcast and discussion, don't forget to subscribe or give us a rating on whatever streaming service you're using. Thanks for listening. See you next time.